Hello everyone and welcome to Tabor Talk. So there are people in jail, prison today, serving sometimes life sentences for marijuana possession. Not dealing, possession. All right, I'm going to show you an older clip. Now this goes back to 92, but the law, I just checked it on the internet, is still on the books. Um... Later on, you'll see a clip for cocaine possession. Life sentences! Watch this. This is disturbing. Is this the country we want to live in? Children range in age from 6 to 15, and they are going to jail. Mandatory sentence on drug charges. Conspiracy distribute heroin and cocaine. They are about to tell you with more detail than I will, just to let you know what we're about today, that they were in rehab. They will tell you they're, they haven't been in the church choir. They have been distracted by drugs. They are just one of countless numbers of families that almost lost everything because of drugs. They connected with rehab. We're doing a good job. We're coming back from the death of addiction when one of their friends offered them, said, why don't you? And then it got to be marijuana. The cops found cocaine. They're going to jail for six and eight years, respectively. They have four kids. They want you to know they never shot anybody, never carried a gun, never owned a gun, and they're saying this is a root and toot and shoot and wild west approach to what is a pervasive American problem that we cannot solve this way, and incidentally, what's gonna to happen to their kids in the six and eight year absence of their parents? And I'm gonna tell you something else. I'll bet you don't feel sorry for I'll bet you want them to go to jail. I want to tell you something else. We're out of jails. We're out of jails. You got the money to build more jails? Stephen is also here. Stephen, raise your hand so we know who. Stephen, you've not been sentenced yet, but you are facing 10 years in prison on charges of marijuana conspiracy. You're the father of three children, age 5 to 19. Uh, 10 years... Uh, was there nothing else in your uh, so-called criminal history? Just pot? That's it. Uh, were you? Uh, uh, did somebody uh, undercover buy from you, or were you selling or just using? I was selling and using. Uh huh. And how much was in your? How did the cops get you? I was ratted out by someone. <clears throat> you say ratted out? Yes. Uh, Meaning an informer? Yes. Somebody who wanted to get his own, his or her own sentence, sentence. reduced. Yes. Cooperate with the cops. And we'll bust good old Stephen. Yes. And you're going to the slammer. Yes. For 10 years? Uh, minimum. Is that a mandatory sentence? Yes. Uh-huh. You've, uh, did you ever do anything else, Stephen? Illegal? <clears throat> no, I mean, was there, was there, was there cocaine, heroin? Never. Or no mushrooms, no LSD? Never. No funny stuff up your nose? No. Just pot, huh? Strictly pot. Where'd they arrest you, at home? No, I wasn't home at the time. Well, how did the bust happen? Were they, they watch you as you made the buy? No, I was informed on. Yeah, and but I know, but what was the physical feature of your... They um, came to my partner's house. He was not home. Neither one of us happened to be home at the time. And we turned ourselves in uh, shortly thereafter, after getting together with lawyers. Uh-huh. Uh, did, uh, did you plead guilty? Yes. Because you thought that you'd figure a judge would be enlightened and know that you're not Jack the Ripper... And maybe give your probation, was that it? Some of that. Um, I and you got the... 10 years? Yes. Typical. Typical. <clears throat> Patricia and Scott, let's talk about you. Um, so you do acknowledge that uh, you have... Uh, uh, you're from, uh, did, I, uh, this happened in Vermont? Yes. Yeah. Uh-huh. You don't want to do drugs in Vermont, huh? No. <laughs> don't want to do drugs. Don't want to do drugs at all. Right. No. But some states are more militant than others, isn't that yeah, so? Yeah, that's right. As we understand you, it. Yeah, and Vermonters are not about to feel sorry for you either. But this uh, is a federal law. This is a... F uh, thank you. Important thank you. A uh, very important point. You're, you were charged under federal law, right. superseding all the states, so... Right. Uh-huh. Okay, let's talk about your p uh, particular history here. Uh, you've been married then for at least 15 years, have you? No, or we've been married since 1984. Uh, I see. We got together in 1980 and got married in 1984. Okay, and, you're, and as I've said, your children, you have four kids ranging in age from 6 to 15, and I met them out there. They're beautiful <clears> young uh, kids, no doubt, Nobel Prize winners uh, all. No kidding. Uh, yeah. Quite obviously, you don't yeah. beat your kids. Okay, no. all right. All right. Um, what'd you do? You, uh, you got into heroin and the big, the, you know, the so-called 
Not everybody would agree with this distinction. A drug's a drug, therefore... Okay, but you did heroin and uh, cocaine for a while, is that so? About a year, a year and a half. And then you, you, you discovered you were hooked and you wanted to do right. something about it, huh? Yeah. Do I understand also that you bought and sold or traded within a small community of friends? That's right. So you were not in any commercial business of selling? No. But you do tell us that uh, your, your habit got to be bad enough that every dime you ever earned went right into That's the, right. the acquisition of drugs. So all those horror stories about drugs are true. Right. That's it right. almost ruined you. Yeah, it did. Uh, and then what did you both sign up then for rehab? This is all before any arrests. Is that right, so? That's right. So you engaged in this kind of behavior within a small community of friends, probably yeah. on a, not in the middle of uh, downtown Stowe, but yeah. in a rural area of Vermont. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, about a year, you say. Then you realized you were addicted and you, you both entered a rehab uh, program. Is that right? That's right. We both detoxed. It took us three and a half weeks to get back on our feet. Uh, um, at that point, I found that I was still mentally addicted to cocaine and uh, I admitted myself into screening and uh, was put into Maple Leaf Treatment Farm in Underhill, Vermont. Uh -huh. and you were there, for, say, for three and a half weeks? Yes. Okay. Now you come out and you're probably still a little... I assume you... I mean, you went to meetings. I mean, you don't just go and get clean. Right. right. I started my first anonymous, 12-step anonymous recovery group meeting. N-A? N-A. Narcotics, Narcotics anonymous. anonymous, yes. Yes. And you went to meetings? Yes. Regularly? Every night. How about you, Patricia? I went off and on, but a lot of times I had to stay home with the kids, and we didn't have a car, and sometimes Scott hitchhiked, and I just right. stayed home. Uh, is it fair to say that the monkey was not quite as much on your back as your husband's after the release but, from Well, the... I never did cocaine, so I, I was only addicted to heroin. Heroin? Yeah. Uh-huh. Did you smoke it? No. Yeah. Uh, 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 you don't mean to say only heroin. That's bad enough. I, uh, is that this is. what caused your response? Right. Yeah, okay, okay. I think it's important We got to, a hanging jury here. It's uh, important to learn why she became addicted to heroin. I was in a car accident in 1980, and I had um, this side of my face was all wired back together, and I had back problems, and through 1987, I got chiropractic help, and I was on medication from the doctors. An elevator type uh, Valium sort of medication? Tylenol with codeine, Phenophen with codeine. Codeine. Valium, yeah. Codeine is addictive. And Valium. And Valium is, yeah. Valium is as well. And then I stopped taking them. The doctors felt that I was go going to become addicted. <clears throat> and so I started to get some drugs for mm. my When you pain. stopped, did you have, uh, were you edgy, cranky, oh, blackouts? Yeah. What, what, what's? <clears throat> all, of the, all of the above. Uh -huh. So I started looking for some drugs, and I found some Dilaudid. I started doing some Dilaudid and became addicted to that. And then I couldn't get any more Dilaudid, so I started getting some heroin. Uh-huh. Which you administer to yourself? Yeah. Not with a needle? Yeah. Wow. Uh, and all this time, your husband was what? Did he see you? Did he know you? You weren't in a closet to your husband on this issue, were you? No. So he saw you doing this? Yeah. Did you try heroin? Yes, I did. Uh, initially, it started out with Dilaudid, as, as she had said. And um, What's the name of that drug? Dilaudid. Dilaudid. Is, is that a prescription drug? Synthetic heroin. Is what? It's a prescription synthetic, synthetic heroin. heroin. There's a synthetic heroin at my pharmacist? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Definitely. Okay. All right. Orally? Uh, take yeah. Okay. All right. So now you get your buzz, I assume, as often as you can, huh? Well, it's important to mention that uh, part of the reason why I became addicted was uh, initially I had I have a BA degree in teaching, and uh, I um, tried working in the field and found that I couldn't quite cut it, needless to say, and uh, my self-esteem got the best of me, and we had proposed a daycare in Vermont, and I had tried to put together daycare a situation, and then. Um, that fell apart. Someone uh, basically took off with my proposal that I'd worked almost two years on. And then, uh, at that point, low self-esteem got a hold of me, be it that uh, drugs were um, somewhat available in our home. I went one step further. Yeah. I appreciate your honesty, Scott, and incidentally, I just, you know, no one asked me, and I do not insult you to say that I believe you, that, one, that you were on this and you felt like S.H. Mm -hmm. And that uh, one of the ways you get rid of this awful feeling is to put a buzz in your head and suddenly you feel better. I mean, that's, that's true with 
Blood low, light. Low self-esteem mm -hmm. is a, a very m major thing that people should understand is one of the essential reasons very why good. people get into addiction. Okay, now you get into the rehab, you're there three and a half weeks, you get out, you're going to NA meetings, uh, uh, and you still have a pal with whom you had... Yeah. Uh, 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 this is a close pal who was in this, this small community of people who were who were somehow getting hold right. of the drugs. So, right. okay. Right. This is a, a real intimate friend, I want to make. Right. A ten-year friend uh, that I had gone to college with, and we started out with initially in college with uh, doing a little bit of marijuana, and then we'd drink some beer or something at the end of school, at the very end of the day, you know, weekends or whatever. Yes. And then um, um, after I graduated from college in, uh, in, in 1989, 1989 and uh, he um, was in became addicted with us, along with us, and was in our small circle of friends, as, as we okay. call it. Now, we got to get to this, because right. the time is clicking. Right. It's all right. This is important to you. You're o we're only talking about your life here. Right. Okay. You're out of the rehab. You're in N.A., Narcotics Anonymous. Mm -hmm. You're still pals with this guy. Yes. Now, may I assume that at some point after the rehab, he said, let's smoke a J? Uh, no. Uh, actually, um, the way it happened was um, he... When he came out of recovery, we, we were wanted to go into detox go together as a team. When we came out of recovery, um, he he took it upon himself to clean up the world, as a, as he claimed in court, um, by turning me and, and my wife into the drug enforcement agency. So he's now a, a kind of messianic uh, high priest who's going to save the world. atone for sins and. Uh, uh huh. So say you in his absence. So this will remain on the record, subject, of course, to his own lawyer's opinion on this. Did he? Did you guys smoke together? I mean, how did he we, entrap we, you? As did, you allege, he did. We did cocaine and heroin together, um, him and I, and um, he became um, a uh, confidential informant uh, while attending twelve-step anonymous, anonymous groups uh, while we were in recovery. Uh, he would come to us outside of the meetings and talk to us about getting and using, uh, getting drugs, uh, and until the, until we got caught, uh, which we weren't, we weren't doing drugs for six months prior to being arrested. We had gone into recovery, as we had talked about before. Right, but throughout this six-month period, he was talking about getting stuff, huh? Yes. Yeah. And yeah. I, may we assume, I mean, you don't have to, don't make up things. May oh, we assume no, you said to him, well, wait a minute, we just threw this, you know, I'm getting the monkey up, let's not do it? I don't know, I'm asking. Yeah, that was, that even was on a tape when he came to our house wired that I said so to him, no, I don't want to do he it. He comes to you and the feds hear you on the tape saying what? No, I didn't want to do cocaine or heroin ever I again. I want to stay clean. Yeah. Now, sooner or later, you fell off the, ta the wagon here. Yeah, he asked me to get some cocaine for him and I said, no, I, I could try to get you some pot, but I will not get you any cocaine or heroin. And uh, three months after that, after asking and asking and asking, we, we did get 11 grams of cocaine and heroin. A very uh, small amount. How did the bust happen? That's, we, we went and got 11 grams of drugs, and on our way home, we were busted. Uh, what, would you see the gumball machine in your rearview mirror? I mean, how do they do this? I mean, yeah, you that's see this. What they, did. they stopped you as in a traffic violation. Yeah. Welcome to Vermont. We were welcome to Vermont. In other words, you were out of state, were you? Yeah, we when, were in New York. You were in New York, yeah, we and just when you York. cross the state line, the Vermont state line, right. comes the cops, yeah. mark car, they yeah. get out and they search your car and they find what? 11 grams of drugs. And you, uh, you, did you go to trial? No, we pled guilty. You pled guilty and you hoped a judge would look with favor upon your parenthood, etc. And uh, I, did you have any previous arrests? No. Uh, let me show this audience uh, the nation's toughest mandatory sentence states for possession of 650 grams of cocaine. Do you know how much that is? Don't you people know anything? <laughs> All right, we're going to show you. Is this, am I right here? Both boxes. Here are, here are 650 grams of cocaine. Oh, wow. Huh? Is this... Is this? Uh, I don't know. I know. That's about it. right. It's a, pound, a little less than a pound. Well, wait a minute. Uh, we got. With both boxes. <laughs> Excuse me. Come on. <laughs> it's only an hour show. Let's go. Oh, um, now wait a minute. That, as we are told, is this right? Pound and a half. It's a pound and a half. 
650 grams of cocaine. Boy, they're going to love me here at the crew here. All right, there you go. For possessing 650 grams of cocaine, if you are arrested, this is for possession. When they knock your door down and they find this in your little vanity table, if you live in Michigan, show them, Brian, you are going to jail for life without parole. <laughs> what if you're 16? Doesn't matter. What if you're 17? Should have thought of that before. Uh huh. How much cost you for? A, how much it cost you for a year in prison? How much was it? Uh, hang on a minute. We got several shows going here. Massachusetts. Fifteen. Don't argue about it. Fifteen. No parole. Get out of here. New York. Fifteen. Uh, oh, and you're going. You may serve ten. Good behavior. Missouri. You're going for ten. And ten it is. Don't give me this sob story. Huh? You know your kids. You yeah, should have thought about that. Georgia, you're going for 25 years, but you may have only served five. Is that right? Mississippi, 20. Pennsylvania, where'd you get so liberal, Pennsylvania? <laughs> Four years. Now, let me say, let's get this in. Let what me tell you something. Boyfriend? What happens if, if, one, if your boyfriend is If the is cops possessive. stop you and your boyfriend is driving as you go you're in the car. and you're in the car. You're gone. You know, you just came from a church choir practice. Yeah. He's driving you home, and the cops find this. You're gone. Come on. Absolutely you're gone. Not. No you're way. Gone. Come no on. Way. What is this? And what no kind way. of country do you want? How much for a, how much to keep a person in jail for a year? Round number. Thirty-six thousand. Thirty-six thousand for the rest of his life. We're you're spending paying for twelve it. billion on all this. You're paying for it. And we'll be back in just a moment. So how totally fucked up is that? You know, so last week, Joe had, i um, looking at it right now. He had two people from the Innocence Project, Josh Dublin and Jason Flum were on the Joe Rogan uh, Experience podcast last week. And they were discussing this. Actually, uh, they were discussing some cases. Of people who were actually totally innocent and they were in jail. Some people on death row. It's so fucking disturbing. Um so it's just think about that. In most states, marijuana is legal. Actually, it's not legal here in New York, which is totally crazy. New York, right? New York City, Manhattan, pot is illegal. It's fucking stupid. But anyway, um, it's just, it's so damn disturbing. You're in prison for smoke for smoking pot? Or, the, you know, this, the other one was cocaine. That much cocaine? Just possession, not distribution? That's totally fucked. All right. We got to change these things. Good friends, good books. Excuse me. Good friends, good books, and a sleepy conscience. I almost forgot that. Good friends, good books, and a sleepy conscience. Peace, love, and understanding here on Taper Talk. <laughs> 